Welcome to the Transformations Podcast. Here, guests and I will share our transformative experiences and we'll explore how to find excellence in life. My guests today are Josh Painter and Jack Schaefer. They are both ordained 22nd generation Taoist priests in the Trenzhen Longmen tradition at the John Fugong on Qingcheng Mountain and ordained 25th generation Taoist priests in the Trenzhen Longmen tradition at the Qingyong Daoguan. Jack and Josh are the co-abbots of Parting Clouds, a formerly recognized uh, as a temple organization by Zhang Mingxin, the abbess of the Zhang Fugong on Qingchen Mountain. Jack and Josh, welcome to Transformations. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah. So this is great. It's it's pretty exciting that, you know, like me, you guys are Caucasian and <laughs> that's not what makes it exciting, but that we're all have this uh interest, deep interest in things Asian, right? The the culture, the martial arts, the philosophy, um, you know, and and something in our early, early childhood perhaps stimulated this. Um, Josh, I saw on your Facebook page that you had a picture of you at age 17 in 1990 in Hong Kong with your brother. Uh, is that something that perhaps stimulated the interest of things Asian for you? Or uh, was there something else that kind of... No, <clears throat> no my, my, the reason that I was in China um, at that time was because my grandmother was a student of um, some of the great Chinese painters of the late Qing dynasty, um, Puru in particular. And so my whole child, and she started studying with, with, with these greats, Alison Stilwell, who grew up in the Forbidden City as a, as a, as a Caucasian, interestingly. Um, uh, I grew up in a house, uh, her, in, in visiting her house, which was very heavily influenced by her various trips to China in the 80s and, um, and her her starting painting in the 60s uh, all kinds of chinese art everywhere and so it was a, an aesthetic tradition in our family that first brought me to that she sent my brother and i to china in 1990 it should have been 89 but that summer was no good for travel um because of tiananmen and uh she sent us there and as a sort of um attempt at civilizing the two of us we were uh <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> we were in need we were in need we were in need of uh some alleviation of our feral qualities so she <laughs> sent us to china to um to visit my uh, my uncle was living in singapore at the time and um and he took us all around and that really i think took what was originally a very deep and keen interest and it solidified it for me in one important way, which was specifically this. When I went on that trip, I realized that the only senses that I had were um, uh, tactile, smell, sound, sight, but I couldn't understand any of it. Mm. And I vowed that I would go back and that um, I would have an, an intellectual experience as well as a sensory experience in China with because with language um, you can the, the experience is so much deeper when it's just your senses it's all on the surface as exciting as that can be you walk away and the sense the sensory input is gone and there's nothing kind of left but these sort of memories so knowing the language I think like deepens all of those experiences um, and allows them to be something much more personal. So I vowed on that trip, because I was very frustrated actually, that I would come back and I would know Chinese. Then I went to college the following year uh, as a Chinese studies major with language in particular, and then went to college in Yunnan University in 1994 fluent or so-called fluent in Chinese at that time. And that was definitely, you know, these are the steps that I've taken to, um, to, uh, you know, turn my childhood fantasies into a more concrete reality for wh whether that's good or not. I don't know. Fantasy is kind of fun. Fantasy is terrific. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That quite fortunate that, um, that you had that, those cultural surroundings at home here 
um, and then were able to go overseas to kind of experience the the truth of it without the without the glasses of American culture over top, you know, and of a yeah. American lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, tremendous. American. I mean, the, the the Chinese the Chinese experience in America is interesting because the diaspora community, um, of which I have been always embedded within as well, um, is interesting because the diaspora community is really diverse here. We think you know there's a the typical view of the Chinese in America, but the Chinese in America are coming from vastly different experiences depending on when they came here where they came from, et cetera. And so um, that, uh, that too is like a really interesting thing because mainland China is not what the American diaspora community is like, especially in the 70s and 80s and 90s as, as I grew up in New right. York City experiencing those communities along that trajectory. When I was first speaking Chinese in New York, not many people understood what I was saying because they were all speaking Tai San Hua. Because right. they were all from the Taishan area. And so eventually the Mandarin that I was speaking has now become the sort of lang li the, the lingua franca on the street of New York's Chinatown. So it's really interesting how that's changed. Yeah. yeah that, that diaspora community thing is pretty interesting, right? Because when you, if you go to, for example, San Francisco's Chinatown, it doesn't look anything like anywhere in China. So most people hear their relationship to what they think is Chinese or these sort of chinwazari buildings in Chinatowns, which don't resemble anything really in China, and lion dancing. And, you know, there's this almost like comic book caricature of what mm -hmm. they think it is. It's, it's very, it, it's very eye opening when you get over there your first time. You know? Yeah, I, I kind of think of Chinatowns as, Chinatowns as mini Hong Kongs, you know, um, a lot of Cantonese speaking, uh, you know, Toysan, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Southern Chinese, who were the first ones to build our Chinatowns. And in our Chinatown in Philadelphia, we have, I think, over 40 associations there, all different, Hokkien, yeah. Fujian, you know, there's just so yeah, yeah. many uh, that, uh, let alone New York City, uh, where there's just, just, there's just tons on every block on, on Mott Street and, and Grand and, and Canal Street and, and others, as, as you know. Jack, what was your kind of entree into Asian culture and this kind of blooming interest to follow a path? I, you know, mine is diff mine's definitely different than Josh in a lot of ways. I don't, and in a lot of, it, there's a big part of me that doesn't even understand why it happened, to be honest with you. You know, I was a pretty young kid. I had an interest in martial arts, you know? And so in the, in the 70s, when I was a little kid, I was very interested in it. Um, no idea why, because I don't really remember watching a lot of martial arts movies. My dad was very interested in it, but he didn't practice. And so at around six years old, my parents stuck me in judo. And I did judo for several years. I used to live a few doors down from who would become my first karate teacher. And I would go down to his, his place and throw a ball at his front door until he would come outside and talk to me. And, you know, and we would chat and he would... I, he'd like let me look inside of his place and I'd see all of his his like martial arts junk around in his place. And he had actually a, years later when I was a little older would become my first teacher. And I just had this real interest in martial arts as a kid and I really wanted to do it authentically. So, you know, at about 10, I got very interested in learning Japanese. And so I had a Japanese dictionary and I was teaching myself to write characters and teaching myself Japanese words and habitually watching the miniseries Shogun to try and learn Japanese words, you know, and that became my first entree into it. And so it, it, it took on a life of its own where it was just something I didn't know was not common, you know? And so I would just, I trained through that and I met different teachers. And as I got a little bit older, I got much more interested in the culture of Asia different cultures and, you know, and I always really liked approaching that through language. And so, you know, by the time I hit college, I did three years of Japanese and I also studied Chinese and classical Chinese in college as well. And, you know, I, I, I didn't like having a translator ever. It, it drove me nuts because I really wanted to be able to experience the language myself and experience the meanings behind things. And so 
that's that's what pushed me into the language. But as I was getting older, my I still practice martial arts. I still love it. It's still a daily thing for me. But I also started to get much more interested in the philosophies that were behind a lot of these things and what I thought was Taoism and what I thought was Buddhism in my late teens and early 20s, you know. And I luck I got really lucky because I had this this martial arts teacher at the time who lived in in Okinawa for a long time when he was younger as part of the military and he had these friends in Taiwan and they their family had been practicing this particular style of Taiwanese martial arts for a long time they invited me to come stay with them and learn their family's martial arts and their family's medicine and I was like wow I this sounds like a great way to be in Asia it sounds like some you know a good way for me to keep doing martial arts, but to learn medicine because I didn't, I watched all these people ahead of me try and make a living as martial arts teachers. And we know how well that doesn't go for most people. Right. <laughs> you know, most people, they either do something they don't want to do and don't feel good about in order to make a living, or they do something they feel good about and they don't make a good living. And I thought, well, being a Chinese medicine practitioner will be the way for me to make, help make a living. And I can still teach martial arts on the side and whatever else I want to do, you know, mm -hmm. but then I investigated it and I realized that um, doing a foreign apprenticeship, you can't get licensed in the United States very easily. So I decided, well, I'll just go to school. So I went to school and I got my master's and doctorate here in the States and went to China after I graduated here. And so I spent time in Nanjing and then I went back and forth. I think I've been nearly 20 times or something since the first time to, to be in China. And so I'd go back for a while. I was going back and forth once a year, a couple times, twice to study Chinese medicine, but also, you know, I was studying um, uh, Yin style Bagua Zhang with Shei Pei Qi and He Jinbao. And so I would go spend time with them every time. And then they, then He Jinbao would come to the States and I'd spend time with them here. And, and so I was just going back and forth as much as I could, you know, and then doc, the, the doctor, he was really, interested in things other than martial arts. He was very interested in meditation and Qigong. And, you know, I, I'd been doing that stuff since I was a teenager, but his take on it was really interesting to me. And he kept always saying, you need to, you know, you need, you need to spend time studying the Tao. You need to spend time studying the Tao. You know, he never really talked about Buddhism much. He didn't really care about it too much, even though his art was supposedly both. Mm. But he just, that was something he said all the time. You need to study the Tao, you need to study the Tao. And I got more and more interested in it. And just, I guess the, the trajectory of this from six years old to now in my early 50s is momentum. I just kind of got on this train and the train is still trucking along. Only now it's taken on a different flavor. You know, right. I don't do judo and karate anymore. You know, I've, I have a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but I haven't been on the mat in, since COVID. You know, um, but I, I, I don't teach Bagua publicly in, anymore, just a few private people. My Most of my focus is really on parting clouds and, you know, translating and teaching Taoist education and, you know, spending time in that. And Josh and I have been our last, I don't know, what have we, our last five or six trips to China have been all Taoist focused, you know, spending time in the temples, spending time with Taoist teachers not doing anything else, you know? So I can't say it was anything other than the momentum of a train <laughs> that I jumped on as a little kid. And I think I belong on this train, so I haven't gotten off. Yeah, that sounds good. So it's interesting to me that both of you kind of got into this and were really pulled toward the language part of it, you know? Um, because for me, I got pulled in early and mine was on the physical practices, right? Because I always, I don't know why I don't have, I, I struggle with languages. Um, you know, I, I took too, five, year, yeah, five years of Spanish. I took Spanish one, Spanish two, Spanish two, Spanish two, Spanish three. <laughs> <laughs> and that's supposed to be easy. And then I lived in Japan and I'm studying Nihongo, right? And 22 trips to the Philippines and learning Tagalog and then learning Cantonese and all my Kung Fu techniques and terms are all in Hokkien because, because my teacher taught in Hokkien. So it's just like my, my, my brain for some reason is not holding well enough, but I'm trying. Uh, and you guys are like 
super fluent and I love it. Uh, but that's an avenue that I would have wanted to go in if I if I had a better way of learning the languages or it you know the method had come to me easier because using translators you don't get the meaning of what's being said to you if they're not fluent in that meaning you know and and the subject matter I know from you know commissioning translations of things it's you know it's it just doesn't line up and 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 each different term has a different meaning for the same idea yeah. and, and then wanting to feel like yeah. the conversation and not just the outsider uh and especially well that's reading. a distinct oh, that's so important that's so important mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a distinct issue in the translation of Taoist texts, and it's and it's it's interesting that it is one of the main limiting factors. Even in uh, just because something, by the way, has been translated, doesn't mean that it is now uh, directly correspondent to the original. Right. Because it's still the you're still getting a lot of the the uh, filter, which is to say, the person who's doing the translating. So, if if the person is not a Taoist, for instance, or in the case of Longmen, uh, if they're not um, very fluent with the with Buddhist terminology, um, when when translating Longmen texts, you have to have both uh, understandings pretty um, solidly understood. You can come up with a text in English that's, you know, pretty distant from the original intent of the original. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, translation and language are the mechanical, the language understanding is the mechanical part of, it's the first phase of understanding something, especially with Taoism. You can, you can run something, through, for instance, if we take the, the worst translator in the world, which would probably be Google Translate. Yes. <laughs> I'm not even talking about yes. humans now. So, but this is really interesting because if you take Google Translate, what Google Translate actually is, is it's a completely non-nuanced um, translator. What Google does when it translates, it will put the most uh, heavily weighted usage value on the translated term. So it, it is the most common version for that word. But when, you, when the context is Taoism, you can see how even though it's producing an al algorithmically sound translation, using the most common values for these terms, it is absolutely problematic and wrong. And so as translators, as human beings, we also have to think that, am I being Google Translate just an organic version of that? You know, Is my understanding of this term the one that is intended in this text? Do I know where this text comes from? Do I know when this text was written? Because a text in the Tang Dynasty and the text in the Qing Dynasty are going to have different values for different terms. And a text from a Buddhist source versus a Taoist source are also... So you add a few of those layers up, and next thing you know, you could be reading something parallel, but not in line with the original. Um, yeah. And you, can just make, you could make a book all of your own. You're essentially an author, not even a translator in that sense. Yeah. And so... You know, this is this is really weird because a lot of people are learning Chinese and a lot of them are suffering from the hubris that would that that would produce these kinds of uh, strange translations. And so we see this. I mean, you see it a lot. And as more yeah. people are interested in Taoism and they've got, you know, an undergrad degree in some in Chinese and, and a trip or two to Beijing, next thing you know, they're like on the on the map as some expert. And we've got a significant problem on our hands because these things are now are going to exist for posterity. And they could, depending on the marketing skills of people, which also seems to be a forte of certain generations, they can market a, a, a pretty problematic translation as if it were the next greatest thing. And now we have it as a standard. And that could that is that is really weird. So, you know, I think that understanding each of us understanding these particular um, pitfalls and limitations is really important because we should all like really just calm down and you know one of the dangers too is that that sometimes the translations start to minimize things because somebody will read into it oh the meaning is that they mean in this moment is x right and then they minimize the 
meaning to always mean X. Like I'll give you a, a martial arts example. Sure. So I remember when I was a teenager, I was training with the my teacher's grand teacher, this Okinawan guy. And I knew what the word punch in Japanese was. And the translator was kept saying, I could hear the guy saying a certain word in, in Okinawa, and I didn't know this word. And the translator kept saying punch in this movement, but I knew he wasn't saying punch to him. And they would have these little conversations. And I was finally, I asked a friend, I was like, what, who spoke Hogan as well? And I was like, what's he saying? He says, hand moving out, Yeah. right? So if, if, if you're just saying hand moving out, not punch, that implies a lot of things. It could be any move, anything of your hand. In this one application of it, it meant punch. But if you always then from there on out, everything, every time you use that word was punch, you took away all the nuance of that particular technique. And to me, that was a shocker. I was like, wait a minute. So this could mean a, I, my, a palm hit, a reach out and grab. It just had to mean my hand was moving away from it. Mm -hmm. And then we run into that with Taoism because people will take a, a word in translation and they'll translate it into something like, like uh, really simple, you know, or singular. And then they'll always use that singular word over and over and over again. And that can be a real problem because it, it's not always meant that way. And you can see that in commentary. But the other problem is some translators, I'm not going to name names, will basically write the commentary in. And then when you're, a you're reading it, you get confused because now this word means 42 different things. And you don't understand why. You know, it's, yeah. it become, it can become bonkers, you know, and like Josh said, then, then those things, they're there forever <laughs> and they can lead to a lot of, of confusion for future students. But I, 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 and in, in good, in like to, 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 to give people the benefit of the <clears throat> doubt, I understand how in an emergent tradition, um, a glossary needs to be established, which is to say the tradition of translating Taoism. A glossary needs to be established in, to, to form some rigor, some foundational rigor. The problem is, is if we're too vigilant about that glossary or if we're too adherent to it, then we end up, we're losing a lot of the potential for, for nuance. And, and that's all that I'm saying. I'm not trying to critique yeah. other people because I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, an amateur. I'm, I, am, I have no doctoral degree. Now, I'm probably as guilty of everything I'm saying as anyone else, but I do see that there is the problem and uh and i'm and i'm really interested in how this will be resolved because i don't think it's going to be resolved by me but i do think it will be resolved as is as long as we can maintain an open minded so what what happens is if we if we're too offensive toward which is the new tradition of social media which is anonymity offensiveness you know brutality towards each other if we can avoid doing that and have a more understanding you know conversational feedback about translations maybe there can be an evolution rather than encampments and sieges you know what i mean yes. so i feel like there's so much to to be experienced in camaraderie and there's so much to lose in um uh encampments tribalisms mm -hmm. um and so i feel like as is the case with so many things in the Taoist world, real, full, authentic desire for friendship, camaraderie, and communication and cooperation is how extraordinary things will occur. But if we encamp ourselves in our various um, economic, isolated ver forms, which is to say the various schools and online programs and blah, 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 of which we have, which is also a necessary thing, I think, to have some sort of structure for what you do, but it can't become like a um, uh, uh, entrenched um, uh, defensive position that like no one else, you know. So I think like there's a lot, there's a lot of space in Taoism to start growing now that we have people who are interested in going way beyond Alan Watts and the rest of those 60s and 70s things. You know what I mean? I, um, I think I read or, or heard that the, that the Dragon Gate uh, sect is kind of trying to all of the different temples to organize their language. It, is that something that is correct? 
so that they're all using the words in the same, uh, the characters in the same way uh, or the same meanings or it, did I mishear something? Oh, no, you I know, don't know. I don't know because in, in Chinese, mm -hmm. it's all, I mean, it's pretty homogenous for the most it part. Is. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because they're reading from the original text with maybe variations of a word here or there okay. in, in the text itself. But I don't think, I think maybe some of the understandings might vary, but that's part of the evolution of the religion. Right. The other but thing I don't about think they're doing something differently. Yeah. The other thing about the Chinese terrain in terms of uh, the temple um, nomenclatures and, you know, uh, understandings of language is that the, the Taoist temples are populated by graduates of the Taoist colleges. There's only two of those. And their curriculums are consistent with each other, as are the migrating teachers. So okay. th there is standardization there. What I think might, what you might be referring to, and it is an ongoing project in the Taoist Association, is in outreach to uh, foreign communities. There is an attempt at standardization. That is happening. Maybe that's and that might be what you're referring to. Yeah. 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 yeah and um, that's to try and correct for all the errors in the history of teaching in the West, you know, because right. people, people sharing Taoism in the West have been sort of explorers. They've been for the longest time just trying to do their best. And so maybe they're learning things, you know, um, insufficiently, or maybe from people who are misleading, not by purpose, you know, right. just by, and, and now there, there's an effort to raise the standard of yeah. Taoist education. Yeah. Jack, you're being too generous. So there have been explorers, but there also <laughs> have been, there also have been exploiters. Right. True. True. Um, so it is, and it, it is, and has been possible to go to China, get a few pictures taken, put them on your website, say that you're the only living blah, 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 from this temple system. Yeah, I've got the secrets. You know, there's definitely has been that. And the problem is, is that if that person ha is deeply inexperienced, their authority does not match their experience, and they will then taint uh, the waters. So you know, we there is as, as generous as Jack is being. There's definitely um, been history of people sort of causing problems in the dissemination of Taoism outside of China because of this um, issue of uh, a a lack of governance of of Taoist communities, which is great. But we, if 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 we're going to lack governance, then we're going to have to take personal responsibility and at least self-govern, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that is to say, each individual really teaching what they know and not what they're inventing, um, saying what's true and not spinning crazy stories. So I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the Chinese association's integration with Western communities is great so long as it doesn't become too heavy handed. And I think that Western communities teaching Taoism is great so long as they don't become too inventive. And so there's some really nice balance that can exist between these two places and hopefully we can get there, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, we see an Americanization of many things Asian, of Japanese culture, Chinese culture, Filipino culture. Once without any checks or balances, it becomes a thing different than in its original yeah. country. We yeah, see General, Chow, right? General Chow's chicken. General Chow's chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing better than that. <laughs> yeah. It's That's great, right. but it's but yeah. it's not it's, it's not, not Chinese. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. funny. So who yeah. are the three perfect masters, the three celestial masters, and what did they represent in Taoism? Well the, the oh, San the three San purities. Yeah. Hmm. They yeah, they're a symbol of the what we call the three treasures. I think Sanbao. would be one of the yeah, the simplest way of thinking about it. You know, they symbolize the Tao the teachings and the teachers that's probably the most obvious level and it's definitely the place where beginners should start like if we look at for example um like Wang Kunyang's writings on this you know one of the things he he goes into is he goes into a discussion about the three treasures that any he, he of course connects them through the to the three purities the you know the those three deities but what he he really spends more time talking about are you know, the treasure of the Tao itself, understanding and connecting to the Tao, cultivating the Tao, the treasure of the scriptures as a, as a teaching, you know, 
as a way to learn to cultivate the Tao. And then the treasure of the teachers who are the piece that's required to unlock the scriptures. And we have to have those three treasures. So that's, I think for a beginner, particularly, that's the place to start. Of course, they're multivalent, and mm -hmm. uh, as is the case with most numerical things, um, that three can be a web of associations. And one of the um, um, one of the interesting pieces of the Sanqing is their position in the pantheon, which also correlates directly to their position in the cosmos or in the cosmology. So. They are also um, representations of the cosmogenesis, the very beginnings of the universe. These are the first three entities that came into being from the primordial nothingness uh, or the chaotic nothingness of the Tao itself. And so they represent three types of qi, the yuan qi, the uh, shir qi, and the shuan qi, the, the dark, the beginning, and the, um, uh, and the initial qi. So these are very early entities in the universe. We anthropomorphize them, obviously, but really they're, 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 to estimate them in their truest form would be to estimate them as the colors of uh, yellow, black, and white, and they're the, ori the original issuance of chi out into the universe. They also represent that, you know, and this is part of the thing like that we deal with as Taoist practitioners is rectifying or being able to hold multiple systems of um, uh, symbolism uh, or whatever at the same time. These are both deity and they're also cosmogenesis and they're also concept and they're also, you know, and they correspond to so many things that, that correspond to the number three. We see them arise in the Tao Te Ching chapter. The Tao produced the one, the one produced the two, the two produced the three. And we go from three to 10,000. So there isn't like the three to make the nine, the nine. It just goes from three to 10,000 because their issuance from the Tao itself provides the phenomenal universe with everything it needs to be created from that point on. So that's how we go from three to 10,000. So these Sanqing also represent that, which is to say, the primordial fabric of the universe itself. That's why they're they're estimated by us to be like the highest deities. Um, That's such an interesting thing, right? That's this is a good example of why things get so confusing for folks, mm -hmm. because there's so many meanings to this. Like it, you know, I qualified my answer by saying for the beginner, yeah. right? But if it, if you didn't have some direction on that, you could jump right into there are these three deities I need to worship. Or there are these three energies in the body, or they, you know, there are these three processes of creation. You you could really go all over the place, and the next thing you know, you think you're doing Taoist practice, but you're not. You're kind of doing a, a little zoomed-in chunk of a piece of it, and missing all the rest of the grandeur of it. You know, I think that what you're pointing at, Jack, is also an interesting feature. Uh, since we're since we've already sort of like opened up the topic of the of the the um, exportation of Taoism to the West, one thing that Westerners also do, which is interesting, and it pertains to features of the faith just like this in particular, is that again to use the social media model as the basis to human interaction, the most it, the human interaction in its grotesque form. If we were to say that in a forum somewhere, Reddit, or even on Facebook, or whatever, we would, Jack might have said, the Sanqing represent this. The first comment would be, you're wrong, they mean this. And the second comment would be, both of you are wrong, they mean that. And then for the next thousand comments, it would be people saying, <laughs> you're all wrong, it means this. And so this is yeah. the way we Or there do. would be a comment saying, no, Dao Ka Dao, Fei Chang Dao. Of course, yeah. So just go with the flow. None of this matters at all. There is no such thing as deities in Taoism. So this is what we struggle with. And this is a, a serious problem right. that people don't recognize that Taoism is a very, very spacious vessel that can handle a lot of stuff. And once you're inside of the community, you realize we don't have to do that thing we don't have to do all of that weird, like, you're wrong. 
of course there are things that are from outer space that are totally non sequitur that's not even really anything anyone's ever said or thought written in Taoism. that's different but when we have established norms of what the san Qing represent they can be there can be so many things that are simultaneously a yes you know what i mean and so I do think that that's, I mean, Jack and I could play tag team right now. What do the San Ching represent? And just go yeah. on for, for a long time. Um, and we've given you, each of us have given you one example. And there are many, many others. And, and this isn't to say that there is a hierarchy of which one is more true than the other, or that there is some sort of like sectarianism about this. You know, it's really interesting. The open mind is a, is a much better um, aperture to experience Taoism than a very narrow or closed one, obviously. And I'm stating the obvious, yeah. but but a lot of people, as obvious as that statement is, they will appro approach Taoism through a pinhole, um, yeah. because we 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 tend to think in these very black and white terms about what is and is not. And Taoism, though there are is and is nots, so there are plenty of them. Um, they don't seem to operate in the same framework that we're used to, is what I would say. Yeah, I think many Westerners think in terms of, well, we analyze and group things uh, into segments when we think, you know, uh, a lot of Asians think more abstractly. There's many meanings to words, and we're always trying to make lists and subcategories and subcategories in our thinking. And, and that concreteness, I think, blurs a lot of the um, broader meaning, broader meanings of things when you become too uh, literal and less metaphoric in understanding uh, the concepts of these terms yeah. and all these things. Yeah, I mean, the language I think, you know, One of the best answers, like we used to talk about this in Chinese medicine school all the time when I was teaching there was the answer to a question almost always is, it depends. Right, you know? yeah. It depends on the context of the question. In something like the San Qing, you know, it really does depend on how we are talking about that in the moment. Are we talking about a practice? Are we talking about a ritual? Are we talking about a meditation? Are we talking about doctrine? Mm -hmm. There's always this, this it depends thing. And that was the same with Chinese medicine. You know, it was the same in teaching martial arts. So it's always, you know, variable. And if we try and make it too rigid and not elastic enough, then we get into trouble. The mm -hmm. other problem though, is if we allow it to be inappropriately elastic then the meanings become things that people will just sort of make up and right. i don't have a problem with people being inventive personally as long as they attribute the invention to themselves you know yeah. because all of this stuff was made up at some point by somebody i mean you know but they you, you it's has to be like hey i have this neat idea about this this is yeah. my idea I was just going to say, I mean, in the tradition, when we trace the tradition, <clears throat> what we see is a series, almost like beads on a string, a series of expansions and contractions over time. Mm. And there are these flourishing moments of creativity. And then eventually there's a famous author that says, we need to rope this in. And this is what this, this is useful doctrinal orthodox interpretations of these things. And here is the stuff that is flying off the edges and we need to eradicate eliminate or abandon some of those ideas because they're going nowhere and we can hone all of this creativity back down into the orthodoxy of the tradition and so we see this throughout time we for uh, some great examples would be kunyang would be in the long men sect especially uh, li dao chun and liu yiming they both all three of them i mean not mean to say not both they take these um periods of really profuse imagination and creativity in the tradition and they bring it back in we also see this in the tradition in the various um organizations and organizational moments of the various Taoist canons because there are multiple Taoist canons and each of them is essentially like okay there's a zillion things out there we have to like decide again what is consistent what is more or less authentic and we're going to put it all together so that way we have some place to describe and to establish what is canonical and what's not and then we see yeah. that also periodically throughout time so yeah, it's, it's really interesting right when you look at the literature you'll see 
it's like a continuous thread. Like we talk about this when we talk about the word Jing is in, in canon or scripture or something like that. You know, being this continuous fiber of DNA in the in the tradition that goes from early on to current. Yeah. And then along that, there are all these weft texts, you know, all these things that have kind of come and gone. Some of them stuck around, some of them didn't. The things that stuck around ended up in the new canons, you know, in, in that Josh is referring to. And some of them didn't, but what they all seem to do, the things that stick around are appropriately woven to that one DNA thread. You know, like you could you could almost say, if if I I read this text, if I can make if it makes sense with regard to the Tao Te Ching, it's it's good. <laughs> and if it doesn't, then it probably won't stick around, you know. And we've seen that. We've seen movements come along that in throughout Taoist history that Man, they made a big stink while they were around. And then little chunks of them managed to stick around. And a lot of it just went the way of the dodo, you know, mm -hmm. and didn't stick around. Like like the Tai Ching, like the wide end movements, you know, the, the movements where they're doing external alchemy of consuming substances. Nobody does that anymore. Right. They abandoned that a long time ago. But the things that didn't get abandoned were the ideas of seclusion, the ideas of ritual, the ideas of precepts. Those things kept moving forward because why? Well, because they were in line with the Tao Te Ching. You know, they made sense. You know, they, they made sense to practice. Yeah, and they function. And then they kept within, moving. Yeah, and they function within human society, and they create more harmony in yeah. human society. Taking drugs for immortality is going to. Um, you can we can imagine we can obviously see how quickly that will be abandoned. It's not going to last long, right? Unless Especially there were people, toxic. Yeah, <laughs> right? If there were, if there were people, if immortality was formed from those pills, then we'd all be taking them. But um, the fact that it was a consistent failure um, definitely, and but so we can take that idea, and we can apply it to other Taoist movements and ideas. Will that is that idea too complicated? Is it too restrictive? Is it too outlandish? There's a not luckily there's a lot of years involved in Taoism, and there there's a lot of trial and error, and uh, the Taoists have been really good at taking the ineffective or overly complicated, preserving it in the museum of Taoism, but allowing for new evolutions to take place as the as the um, the spearhead of uh, our attempts at solving the, the the issues of the human condition you know um, and I, that's all I was, the point I was trying to make is just yeah. why go digging around in the dusty attic of Taoism other than for the sake of curiosity because the tradition is alive and well and the the existing um, communities have really uh, extraordinary methods for doing the things that we aim to do. Um, and so the anachronistic search through the attic and basement, as interesting as that might be, we should be very careful about grandma's things when we pull them out of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the chest. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a really interesting thing you bring up right there too, right? This anachronistic recreation, while it's interesting and really romantic and, you know, I, I have a tendency to want to get sucked into that stuff. No doubt. The, the goals of, say, an early Han Dynasty Taoist who was doing external alchemy and the goals of a 21st century Loman practitioner are a, a bit different, too, to some degree. You know, what they were practicing for was a different kind of salvation with, you know, diff for different reasoning than what a Loman practitioner does now. So it wouldn't make sense. It, to, to do something that they were doing then for their goals now for our goals does that make sense you know we have different reasons to do it you know i wouldn't it's like trying to drive a car in a skate park it's just the wrong thing it, it, you ride a skateboard in a skate park because it's built for that so you take external alchemy substances and do those rituals for their type of salvation but that's not our goal right now you know we're doing we're, our goal as Longman practitioners is a different kind of realization, a different kind of enlightenment would be a, a way to put it than they were shooting for. I think we have to keep that in mind when we look at those anachronistic 
eras of tradi the tradition. You know, what what did they do that actually feeds towards my current goal and current evolution as a practitioner? And what didn't they do? Yeah, you know? I mean, in our Jack, in our curriculum. <clears throat> We celebrate those antique traditions. We talk about yeah. them, we teach them. But what we do is while we're looking through them, we isolate for the student the, um, the important themes that will become the yarns to the cable of what becomes ultimately our yeah. lineage and tradition. And so it's impossible not to look backward in Taoism. You have to, because we want to look at how these central themes come to be and how they were important then and how that importance uh, evolves over time like for instance ethical or um, moral features of practice or meditation or um, the the actual body what is the body how does the estimation of the body change over time and so and consciousness obviously and so we want to look at how the ideas develop so that we have a very meaningful relationship to um, the current incarnation of practice as it exists and is manifest in our lineaged form. Um, you know, the scholar, interestingly, the academic scholar, that is not the practitioner scholar, they have this um, privilege to be able to go back and look around and spend lots and lots of time weeding through these earlier things and coming to conclusions about them and isolating them and the dating things and all of that stuff it's fine and good and it's great but i think that um you know the practitioner is at a disadvantage in some way when we look back at history because we have to be very vigilant about not being anachronistic and if we are going to be mildly anachronistic we have to do it in a very skillful way where we our current view informs that other thing we're looking at and that thing we're looking at informs our current view and we understand this sort of like um, uh, interaction between the things and that we're responsible about how we profess that to the next generation if that's our role you know what i mean that it's a really interesting um process i think yeah right because the the scholar practitioner has to be practical with it, it has to be something that they can use and the the academic scholar doesn't. They can just be a synologic historical observer. Yeah. Like, hey, they did this, and we can talk about this, but we don't have to talk about it in a way that would be for practice, because we're just going to yeah. talk about it. But for us, we have to talk. We, we it has to be relevant if we're going to talk about it in a certain way, or we have to find the relevancy in it. Might be a better way to say that. Mm. Yeah. I think, you know, Taoism, like so many other um, practices in Asia, are in embodied practices, you know, so you, you can intellectualize them and you can have them in your, you know, your body, in your mind, in your spirit. And I think with Taoism, because there's kind of these demarcations of the philosophical piece, the literati, the thoughts, the worldview, kind of, I put the scholars kind of there and the philosophers, and then there's that religious communal priesthood, liturgies uh, kind of thing, and then the physical, which is the health, the longevity, the qigong, uh, meditation, tai chi, what, what have you, that would fit into that. Um, do you guys feel that or know that there are many people who embrace all three of those kind of categories, and if I'm missing a category, please add it, or do people kind of just by happenstance or, or their preferences kind of float into one more than another. It's hard to be responsible m members or representatives of a lineage and not inhabit all of those spaces. Right. Um, because the, the, the importance of um, transmission and not minimum. See, we want to be, uh, we, we need to if, if 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 each individual so he, there here's the thing i think that if someone says that i'm doing this just for me then they can do whatever they want right 
Um, you can just do qigong, you can just read scriptures, you can just read texts and philosophize on their meanings, uh, whatever floats your boat. I mean, those are all consequential endeavors and, and they're up to anyone's particular fancy. But I think that in, the, in our case, unfortunately for us, um, is we've been given a responsibility and that responsibility continues with our relationship to the Chinese Taoist Association um, and the particular wishes of our teachers. We're not just considered to be out here doing our thing. We're considered to be out here doing our thing so that other people can also um, engage Taoism in meaningful ways that are consistent with the tradition so that should they go beyond our teachings and um, spend the rest of their lives studying it, they have access to any uh, textual or communal aspects of it without friction and without feeling like, oh, you know, I was set up in the wrong way. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. you, you guys kind of, kind of have this uh, with parting clouds, you have this enormous responsibility, right? It's not just someone reading scripture because they want to and they want to philosophize about it. You're you're set with the task of being very uh, clear on what you're presenting and yeah. having that clearly shared with an online or in-person audience, whoever they may be, and responsible for the, you know, the canon of what it is that you're responsible for and, and, and making that available in a way that can be understood in the West. I mean, yeah. that's, that's kind of, yeah. that's kind of a, that's a big thing, you know, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you Mark. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yeah. I think one thing about that too is like Josh and I have a certain responsibility personally. And one of those also includes being able to hold space for that community to be burgeoning practitioners of the type that they will be. So some people will just be somebody who does a little bit of practice in the morning in front of a home altar and they have their family. And some people will want to become ordained and some people may want to take it really seriously and become the teachers. And we have to find a way to hold space for all of them and, and take them all to the level that they want to be <laughs> to the, you know, without forcing anybody to fit into anything, you know, and that's, that's a trick because like you had mentioned in the opening to this question, there are layers to approaching Taoism. And some people, we have students who really, they're very physical and they love, Taiji and things like that. And we have to be able to authentically teach Taoism in a way that they don't feel like, well, if I do Taiji, I'm doing Taoist practice, you know, okay. but at the same time, not step on that because for them, it cultivates their body in some kind of way that helps them, you know, that makes them feel good. And at the same time, we have some students who are very serious students you know they read every single thing there is to read and we we also want to foster that too because that's who they are as people and that becomes part of their cultivation activities we can't sit there and say well the books you don't need all the books just meditate more you know right we have to let them all kind of find it on their own and just authentically teach it you know it's not our, our responsibility to practice for them or force them into a mold. Yeah, but it is but it is our responsibility to... So what happens oftentimes for us is that um, people may come to us thinking, I want to learn how to write talismans. That's fine and good. You will learn that, but you're not going to learn it right off the bat. And so we teach, how can you write a talisman if you don't understand where they come from, what they're for, what the tradition is that's, you know, that's utilizing these types of things. And so people can get very impatient with the traditional approach of starting from the beginning, um, especially in the West um, or people of Western, Western mindedness, because it doesn't, this is not a, even a cultural thing um, in terms or ethnic thing like that we have students who are uh, non Western students, we have a lot of students from uh, Singapore and places like that, you know, we can, they can be just as uh, impatient as the average American. Um, so it, it's interesting because sometimes the thing that someone wants to study exists within the trajectory of our 
um, teaching schedule like very late and they don't want to get there. They don't want to go through all of the other stuff that it takes to get to that. So it's definitely the diversity of people's wishes for interacting with Taoism really does cause a little bit of turbulence in that regard where, you know, they might just be tuned out for the first while. But then the thing is, is that when we do get to the stuff that they want to do, they're lost. They, they're like, wait, I should have been paying attention all along. I'm going to go back now and do it again. So it's a really interesting mm -hmm. process that we see. It's a funny thing, right? Because you would, you know, you wouldn't expect to learn music that way. You know, you would go, you'd learn to read the music and you learn the notes and you learn all the pieces on your instrument and you learn all the scales and you learn to play other people's songs and you work your way up and then you're writing your own music at a certain point. And they, with, with this teaching, many people want to skip learning to read music and learning scales and just go right to, I want to play my own song. Improv. <laughs> it's garbage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, you know, and in, in this, when it, it, with regards to talismans, if it's garbage, it means it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. So then what do you do? You know, we see that in martial arts today too, that old traditional, yeah. especially the Kung Fu styles, you know, and even the Filipino martial arts, which I'm versed in, people always ask me, just teach me the disarming techniques. Well, I can't unless you learn the strikes and the footwork, the control of range and gait, <laughs> how to hold where the blade yeah. edge. I mean, there's so many things, but then there's yeah. just a thousand teachers just showing disarms on YouTube and teaching at seminars. So people think anybody can mimic anything, but doesn't mean they can actually do it or the mimicry is correct. Right. So, or you have to have just a basic level of fitness right, to be able right. to do it, you know? Yeah. Uh, let's talk about talismans for a second in terms of, uh, <laughs> well, in terms of medicine, because I want to talk about Chinese medicine for a second. And yeah. Yeah. I yeah. want to bring in. So, Josh, are you also a TCM practitioner? I know that, I think I know that, yes. Jack, you are. Okay. Yeah. So, we know, and so am I. So, the conversation. So, we know that TCM you know, basically the canon is the Neijing, right? I mean, the, the old the Yellow Emperor's classic, right? And I think Taoist medicine is the Ling Shu, is where they're pulling kind of the canon for Taoist medicine. Is that true? Or, is, or mm. what is the difference between know, really. Taoist mm. medicine? And well, I know TCM was constructed after the Cultural Revolution, but, uh, yeah, you know. So th this is an interesting history. Um, right. And and I, I teach a few at a few doctoral programs, a, a, a big 20 hour intensive on this issue. Okay. So I'm gonna try to abbreviate here. <laughs> 20 um, hours, we got it. Yeah. <laughs> I think so Taoist, so Taoist medicine, we wanna remember first, if we could just put that on the back burner for one second, but Taoist medicine does have the word Taoist in it. And it's not just medicine with Taoist influence, it is medicine as practiced by Taoists in a Taoist way for Taoist reasons. Okay. So let's just hold that for one sec. Also, the issue of when TCM arose is, an, is interesting because TCM as a nomenclature in 1956 with after the big meetings and all of that stuff, sure, that's true. But what people generally isolate as TCM in terms of the theoretical and practical approaches of Chinese medicine as it's practiced today, that trajectory really began in the Ming dynasty. I mean, that's my perspective on it, having looked back at this a lot. Um, the so-called reduction of Chinese medicine or classical Chinese medicine into the algorithm of, of allopathy definitely existed way before TCM. A lot of what we would call the herbalization of acupuncture. There's so many features. If, if you if you sort it out, if you ask people, what are the discontents that you have with TCM? Should they be discontented? Or what are the features that you can identify as TCM as distinct from other forms of Chinese medicine? Any of those features find their sources from the Ming Dynasty on. So we can really, I think we need to dispense with this idea of the communist de you know, degradation of Chinese medicine. Um, because, and here's the thing, that relationship of certain types of change in Chinese medicine directly corresponds to the acceptance, the utility, 
and the presence of Taoist medicine within the overall academic canon of Chinese medicine, because it was in the Ming dynasty that what we call Taoist medicine or Juyo in particular was excised from the Chinese medical academy. It was in there. It was part of what people learned, talismans and the like. And in the reduction of Chinese medicine, starting from the Ming, when also massage was taken out of the academy, where did massage go? The martial artists. Where did Juyo go? The Taoists. Those two communities held those traditions, bone setting, twena, all of that stuff. You want to learn that stuff? Go to a martial artist. You mm-hmm. want to learn talismans? Go to a Taoist. You want to learn the other herbal and acupuncture-based systems of Chinese medicine? Go to an academy. Because that's where it has been safe and sound. You know what I mean? So that's what we want to look at. Is Taoist medicine something that is like just a a new take on Chinese medicine? And it's not. Taoist medicine has existed for a long time. And it's a very particular type of practice that involves necessarily um, incantation, written form, calendrics of certain types associated directly with incantation and the written form and and a a very interesting and distinct approach to herbology as well so in chinese medicine school we don't learn anything akin to taoist medicine as much as people want to think that they do or pretend that they do you know nefariously or not um it's uh it's a it's a discipline all of its own that requires a ground a from the ground up um uh study to learn to understand its underpinnings how it works from where it gains its potential like with herbs when we take an herb any substance for that matter it has inherent qualities in it of making the body warmer colder puking or pooping i don't know you can do anything you want with various herbs with the talisman it's just something written on a piece of paper it has no potential if the actor the agent of that talisman is not really present in its production the production of the talisman comes from the person so we are the herbal substance you know what i mean we are making this tea of our own practice and so Without that background, you're just copying forms on a piece of paper. And so there's so much to Taoist medicine um, that is um, about Taoist practice. The, the writing of the talisman is like the very tip of the iceberg. It's the last thing we worry about. It's literally like it takes us a few seconds to do, and it's just the act, the final act of yeah, it's the of delivery an extraordinary method. yeah it's just the delivery method it's the it's the the tip of the iceberg of an of an extraordinarily months you know mammoth structure sub uh you know subsurface so learning talismans on a weekend for instance from the get-go from scratch i i think that that's really problematic for instance you know what i mean and irresponsible yeah, I don't know if I don't know if anyone's doing that. So if, if you're feeling sensitive to that, I, I that's not intentional because I don't I don't really know anything about. No, we just I, what, I think what we mean is that it look. takes a long time. You know, yeah, that's all. So, so I think, can I add to this, Josh? Yeah. Is, so you know, one thing to keep in mind is, is that you know Chinese medicine has its own. It bases the it bases its diagnostics and its treatment methods on Chinese natural sciences, right? So yeah. Yeah. You have these ideas of the five phases and yin and yang and all of that. Those are just Chinese natural sciences. They're not particularly, they don't, they're not the domain of Taoists or Buddhists or anybody. They were just the domain of the, you know, early, early Chinese scientists. <laughs> and so the medicine then uses those as a way of explaining illness and a way of explaining cure. So of course it makes sense. Josh mentioned herbs that would warm you up. If you're using these methods of science to see, oh, this person has cold, then the, what would make sense is to use something that would warm them up. The Taoist medicine idea is really different in that we look at those, but we look beyond that for other causes. Yeah. So things that might be 
I'm going to use the word spiritual in nature, you know, that could be, you know, ghosts or demons or, you know, things like that. They could just be environmental chi. They could be somebody's feng shui of where they live, their karma, you know, the, the things they inherit karma wise from their parents and their family or they themselves. Those are all things we look at. And so as a Taoist medicine practitioner, when we do, I'm going to use the word diagnostic, we don't really think of it that way, but we have to actually decide what's the cause of this problem that this person is coming to see you with. And we use other methods than something like pulse and tongue. And there are, are particular Taoist ways of doing this yeah. in order to come up with the problem and then the cure for that problem still matches that problem, just like giving somebody a warm herb for a cold disease. But because if it's spiritual in nature, of course, it's going to need a spiritual solution, right? Mm -hmm. So that might be a specific ritual that we do, a specific talisman that we do, something like that, you know? And so in order to be able to do those, though, you have to cultivate, cultivate an ability. So if you were going to, for example, Josh mentioned incantation, if you were going to say an incantation and write a talisman that was related to a specific deity, that deity has to know who you are. They have to have a relationship with you. They don't just, they're not there just listening and doing anybody's bidding. And so part of the cultivation actually has to be cultivating some sort of authority or relationship with that. So right. we but have wait. long periods of cultivation, but wait, in order to work our way up there. You know? But you, th that cultivated relationship, Jack, that Jack's referring to, must be begun through ritual initiation, though. You don't just yeah. get to pick a deity and relate to it on your own, no. like form this whole thing in your basement. You actually have to be part of the community, be initiated appropriately. Then you cultivate the strength of that relationship on your own. But the initial version yeah. of that relationship is formed in the community of Taoism. Sort of via via introduction, almost as a way to think about it. Right. right. You know, remember the 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 the, the Taoist to deity realm is it's a bureaucratic realm full of different deities of different levels, and you're introduced to them via a certain ritual, and then you're then given that chance to actually work with that particular deity. And, you know, it, right. it sounds really like wild when we talk about it this way, but that's how it works. And then it takes yeah. time, you know, and there are methods of cultivation. Some of them are ritual based. Some of them are meditation based, but it takes a while. Yeah. One of the things that doesn't work is just writing a talisman with intention. Well, my intention is to help this happen. It's not enough, you know, yeah. Because if intention were really that strong, I would be, I would have all the money I need. I would never be sick. You know, like my kids would get into great colleges. <laughs> it's just based on intention alone, but it's not enough. There actually has to be some sort of action along with that. I, I think you, Jack, touched on something that's interesting that I want to just go back to and, and expand on a little bit now that we are expanding on these things. We, maybe this will be 20 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Seven part series, um, no problem. You, you know, on the, on the subject of um, the Chinese medicine's diagnostic method, Chinese standard Chinese medicine, and I don't care whether it's what people refer to as classical or what they refer to as TCM, it's algorithmic and it's um, syllogistic, which is to say it's a series of ifs, thens. It's, it's, it's logical. Um, and uh, it requires very little ultimately um, of us other than an extraordinary memory or a good database of information. So it doesn't, you, you as an individual in Chinese medicine, you could be completely aloof. Uh, you could be actually antagonistic with your patient. As long as you get the data, everything is going to be fine because you can then produce the, associ the appropriate associated formulary and protocol needle wise or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, though a lot of people are very skillful at medicine who are not very skillful as human beings is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, and, and I think that uh, what's interesting about Chinese medicine that we are in the Chinese medicine community 
intentionally and also sort of like um, ruefully blind to is that if a good app were to come out where enough data were put into that app, mm -hmm. it's a pretty simple questionnaire that could be loaded into that app that could produce really sophisticated outcomes treatment wise. Chinese medicine can be reduced to an app, unfortunately for us. And, and, and I'm happy to argue that with people. They can hit me up and attempt that. I really don't care. It's definitely the way I feel. It's the way I've felt for a long time. Um, the thing about, and this is what's so attractive about Taoist medicine to me, is that it cannot be reduced to an app. Right. Our, diagnostics, to yep, our diagnostics are within our humanity itself. They're within our direct perceptions itself. There and is no med the medicine is within us. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's no logical interface. There's no app potential. There's no place for a screen of of uh, of of an information based intermediary to occur in mm -hmm. Taoist medicine. It just doesn't work that way. I'm not going to tell us here how it works. It's too complicated. But it, we don't have that thing, that intermediary, fact-based, algorithmic um, uh, strand of associations that come into the diagnostic method. Um, and so that's what's really attractive to me about Taoist medicine, is that it calls on us as the practitioner, First and foremost, as we the, there are preliminaries for being a Taoist medicine practitioner, and nowhere in those preliminaries does it say memorize everything, which is literally one of the pre preliminaries for de Chinese medicine. Memorize yeah, in fact, everything. it actually cautions you against trying to memorize too much. Exactly. <laughs> it says if you work too hard and memorize too much, you will not be a skillful practitioner. Why? Because you will then be triggering that version of your mind. You'll be yeah. triggering a non-human interaction. And so our preliminaries, essentially, regardless of the, the Taoist medicine community you're looking at, we are of a few lineages and we have researched many others. The preliminaries to Taoist medicine go like this, and I'm going to paraphrase. Don't be an asshole. That is like... That is how we view it from the get go. The rest of it follows in much more ornate and sophisticated and polite ways. But it's basically, if you're doing this for money, it's not going to work. If you're doing this for your ego, it's not going to work. If you're doing this um, for any nefarious or dark purpose whatsoever, if you even have an inkling of that in your mind, if you're bored, if you're tired, if you're ignoring mm -hmm. the patient, it will not work. All of our preliminary build up to the practices is based on recognizing and expanding on our humanity our generosity our humaneness and compassion these are the ingredients of the taoist medicine practitioner and in in, in my chinese medicine education i had a class clinical counseling where a psychologist came in and talk to us for a minute about being good people in some kind of way or another. And that was the extent of the ethical content of the program. And so, you know, the rest of it was memorize everything and you're going to spit it out for us periodically. And if you spit it out really well, you're going to get an A and you're going to go out there in the world and you can brag to people about your grades or something. I don't know. What's the outcome? <laughs> So right. well, think about it, right? What, what Josh just said something I think is really important. I want to pause it because he said, you know, he, he's, he's really spending a lot of time on ethics about this. Remember, we, we both have mentioned the medicine is made within you. So the medicine isn't made on the paper. It's not anything else. The medicine is made within you as the practitioner. That medicine has to be made in, in sort of purely, right? Like you're not going to give somebody like, um, med medicine that's been tainted, they pull that stuff off the shelf. We, we, nobody gives herbs to somebody that have pesticides on them if they know it or that are the wrong herb that it's going to make them sick. We avoid that. So this is the same thing, that medicine that's made within you through your cultivation as an ethical human, but also through these other cultivations that we're talking around and not directly about. Those are the things that allow you to be able to do the ritual 
to create that medicine that you just write on a piece of paper and deliver, you know, and the delivery method varies depending on what we're doing with it. But that, that just writing it on the piece of paper is transferring it from you to a form that that patient or that person or whatever can use, you know, but it has to come from that pure place, that clean place, that, you know, ethical place. Otherwise it's, it's going to be garbage. Yeah. It wouldn't work. Yeah. I mean, we, we see this in various places that write about, uh, I mean, in the, in the old days of studying this stuff, we had things like, um, for better or worse, Strickman's Magical Chinese Medicine, for instance. And so when Strickman's writing that book, he talks often in that book, as far as my memory serves me, it's been a long time since I looked at it, but, um, you know, about the the practitioner creating the medicine. And I never really understood what that meant because in the world of Qigong, for instance, if it's a Qigong informed interpretation of that, what one might think is that the product of Taoist medicine is through the internal manipulation of our own internal substances. Right. And then we're going to zap them with qi or something. Yeah. So the problem with that, as, as much as I like the idea of that and as attractive as that is, and I, Jack, you tell, correct me if you have seen, I have yet to see evidence in the actual literature and community of Taoist medicine where that's the case. That it's yeah, a physiological, physical manipulation of internal energies that are then made e- exemplified on some piece of paper for someone else to imbibe of our energies. It's not an energetic thing. Mm. In all of the Taoist medicine precepts, it is a it's a it's an ethical thing more entirely not it's not and the energetic aspect does exist and we know that but it exists through incantation it's the incantations yeah. and the in, invitations of deity and other energies to come into us to do this stuff but it's not our yeah. own stirring ourselves up in a qigong kind of way it's yeah i was it, just going to say if it is if it is energetic it's involving you as conduit, not right, right, you right. as source. You know, yeah. it's really um, it's interesting. That to me is really interesting. How the qualities that form the basis for Taoist medicine are so refined that even our own body is too coarse. You yeah. know what I mean? regardless of the yeah. of the 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 chi that we may be talking about really and and i'm sure that there are versions that are more somatically oriented versions of taoist medicine in other communities but in the communities that we um engage with and are members of we have yet to see that be the case you know and i think this this cultivation aspect to it is one of the reasons that you will find if you look hard enough lots of people that publish books of talismans or how to write talismans you know but you don't see a lot of people doing it yeah and and even less you don't see a lot of people purporting the results they get Mm -hmm. you know and i think that always falls back to the very beginning are they even starting it out correctly because like josh mentioned early on in this the physical form the writing on a paper is something that can be learned you know, it's not hard. You can learn, you can, you can copy it and memorize it pretty quickly. Or the way some people, you know, teach it, it can be really loose how you write it. Mm-hmm. But you don't see a lot of folks actually, you know, talking about the results they get with it, you know. And I think that's because they probably either aren't doing it or they're not getting the results. And they're focused on just the, the image is great. It's fun. You can produce a book of them really fast. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're efficacious, you know, or it doesn't mean the person doing it is efficacious. And the, the, we've witnessed things from our own teachers and our own personal practices. We could tell stories sometime, you know, that it, it's wild and it does work. But um, none of it is none of it is just because we are freewheeling it, you know. It's all based yeah. on that cultivation and all based on the process. Yeah, I believe I believe that, and I believe in it. Uh, in the Philippines, they have these things called orations, which are incantations. 
and uh, hunting hauntings yeah. with amulets with engravings on them. And you can buy them yeah. on an, you know, from a vendor anywhere. I mean, there's vendors selling them in the street and <clears throat> and you can buy books with all the orations in them. Uh, but they need to be given to you by somebody else and with a bit of a ritual uh, for mm -hmm. them to, to work, right? Otherwise, they're just trinkets and uh, a nice thing to kind of think about and look at. And yeah. there was a, a, a famous master uh, in the Philippines uh, in the 90s who wrote three orations for me and prayed over my anting anting amulet. And one of the orations was to not get bit when a rabid dog is coming to you. And I just thought, well, mm -hmm. when you live in Tondo in the in Manila in this really poor with corrugated <laughs> metal houses, you're going to have rabid dogs. Okay, I'll take it. Yeah, how practical. And that was right? one of I the three, that. you know. And uh, but we were walking through and there were some dogs and it they were walking toward us. And I'm like, oh, they're coming awful fast. I mean, there's a lot of other people around us, but don't you know they turned? I mean, you know, I yeah. Just yeah, we know. <laughs> but we know. We do know. <laughs> yeah. And, and he, he did a thing where he wrote Oracion, a, a talisman, so, you know, in Filipino style, and held it in front of him and had a guy with a 22 caliber pistol shoot him. And it missed and hit the rock, you know, on the, the rock wall next to him. It just, it was pointed right at him and ricocheted off wow. the side. I mean, crazy stuff. Uh, and, you know, he would fight in matches with. <laughs> with steel blades, you know, and he would be chewing on a piece of wood that, that, you know, had these things on it in his mouth while yeah. he's fighting and he wouldn't be cut. Yeah. I mean, super sharp edges I love yeah, it. passing the blade. His name was Illustrissimo. Yeah. But um, when I, I that stuff. saw those things, I knew for me that it was no longer just fun, make-believe stuff that, you know, we want to believe as superhero kind of myth and lore uh, in, yeah, China, in the Philippines, and anywhere. Like, I mean, these are things you can't fake. Yeah, you know, I mean, and once you've experienced it, yeah. you can go whole head into the study of it, even though a million people around the world are like, oh, it's just woo woo. And it's like, yeah, you just, you haven't had the experience with the right people in the right group at the right time to see that it's not, you know. Yeah, you break up a great point, Ryan, right? Because it does look like woo woo when it doesn't work. Oh, totally. You know? and yeah. There's a lot of people who, who get it wrong and don't get it right, you know. And, and I definitely fact, don't put myself out there as like the end all be all of it. Yeah. But we do. We after after studying it for all these years now, I can understand why when it doesn't work, you know what's going on. You know, with the last week I was doing as needs uh, to look back. A Zoom with somebody else who is, it lives in Italy, and he had a Taoist, you know, right of food talisman burn it, put it in the water and have them drink it or tea. He said, nothing happened. And now I think like with this, with what you're explaining here about how much has to go into this, quickly jotting something down and throwing it in tea and drinking it isn't going to, you know, off the cuff, isn't going to produce any kind of results. Well, yeah. Also, what was it supposed to do? Oh, you know, if it was... It was if it was supposed to make him fly, then maybe that was um, mis misguided from <laughs> you were there. misguided from from the get go. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you know, also one of the things about these that that you know in the the there's there's a, a descriptions of who you who you give these things to, mm -hmm. and one of the things about it is, you know, you don't you you don't give it to people who don't have faith. Right. You know? If they don't if if they're completely agnostic to the whole thing it's it's probably going to have a harder time working right. you know i mean if you were a deity and somebody's like i don't believe in them they're ridiculous this is stupid why would you feel maybe pulled i don't know you know i well, I, I don't know why but i do know that that's one of the teachings is that's in our preliminaries who, yeah who don't who are who are agnostic to it who don't believe or trust even i think the word is usually trust yeah. You know, then it's hard to, you know, if they're already approaching you from like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I guess I'll try it. I don't know. Whatever. What do I have to lose? That's yeah. that's a tough, tough place to be. There is also there, there's there's that, Jack. But then there is the other one that says those who make light of it so that there are people who mm -hmm. joke about it. And so there's the people who don't have faith, but then there's also the antagonistic. Right. And so um, 
if if you're about to give a talisman to someone and they have that show and prove attitude, then I, and I, I don't know. Even giving someone Advil when they're like, this is not going to work, it's not going to yeah. work. I mean, it doesn't right. matter what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. We know Remind that from shut it down. Yeah, yeah, we know that from studies of of things that you know have these really strong pharmaceutical effects. They're challenged mm-hmm. by people's attitudes, as they are also you know uh, propelled by people's attitudes. You yeah. Know? So, yeah, that nociceptive response even can, it's, it's pretty easy to generate in somebody who doesn't have right. any belief in it. And mm-hmm. They don't have to be Taoist necessarily. They just have to be willing to trust and have some sort of faith that they can get better and you know, mm-hmm. things can change, which makes it, you know, doing this in the West a little tricky. It does. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I wouldn't, I want to segue into uh, the concept of the heart mind. Uh, mm-hmm. We can kind of change tracks a little bit and 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 kind of see if we can thread that in with um, ideas, Taoist ideas about consciousness and liberation. I don't know if that's too big. We could narrow it, um, <laughs> you know. But you know, TCM and and Taoism they talk about the heart mind as one as one entity, the heart and mind. Uh, and and maybe you can speak a little bit about that and how it may be. If is that related to consciousness, or is that a psychophysiologic, uh, psychophilosophical concept rather than a consciousness concept? Yeah, when mm-hmm. when we see the character Shin in Taoist works, obviously it could refer to the um, the organ of the heart, mm-hmm. um, but more generally speaking, and almost always, it refers to the mind. Um, and the mind is one of the primary domains of Taoist practice. Um, the cultivation of the mind, of course, is the cultivation of a non-dual awareness that is uh, at one uh, synchronous with and all of that with the Tao. So the Tao that is the, the, the mind, the aspect of the human being that is capable um, of being one with the Tao is the mind through non-dual awareness, sustained non-dual awareness. So that's what we mean when we say heart, generally speaking, or mind, Um, unless it's an obvious um, anatomical location for practice, which is to say in the chest, like that we do see that as well, but that's really easily understood because it's noted as such because it's a it's an aspect of a visualization that says put this here or put that there and in those cases we know what it means but in most other cases when it says the shen wants the ching jing jing for instance the shen wants to rest um in the heart or or the the the, the shen wants to rest the mind harasses it the heart harasses it what that means is that the mind is harassing the shen and in, I think it's interesting because in Chinese medicine, we say that the Shen resides in the heart. But I think that that's actually because we're trying to create a very distinct five phase correspondence to organ organic structures. But I think we even there in the most like overtly organic structure or organization, we still want to think of the Shen as residing in the mind. You know? I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's always both, Mm -hmm. but more one or the other, depending on the utility of the, or the the method of the text or aspect of tradition. Right. And for the viewers who may, and listeners who may not be familiar with the word Shen, we're talking about a spirit or a a disposition, Um, you know, um, are we separating that from an idea of consciousness? of of how the brain perceives everything or our greater while we're talking about non-duality we're talking about consciousness but are we talking about uh when we talk about shen are we just talking about kind of a spiritual nature or our psychological disposition at a given time that's affecting the heart how are you defining that for us in taoist practice so we can revert to some passages in scripture that deal with this in particular and so the, there's a, a continuum 
in our consciousness from the external world to the deepest aspect of the self. Mm -hmm. And on that continuum, the, the mind um, is like this intermediary between the sensory experience of objects in the world and our deep consciousness understanding of those things. So it's the interpretive aspect of, first of all, this is what I think it is in a conventional way, because we know ultimately it's not what we think it is, but in a conventional way, this is a box, it is blue. And then furthermore, that I like it or that I don't. And that's really important as well. Whether we have an affinity toward that object or an aversion to that object is really where the the mind and the spirit start to uh, experience the turbulence of that relationship because once we decide from the overtly conventional box blue into the i like or don't like we're now making a decision whether we want it near us or further away from us and that's the part that harasses the spirit mm -hmm. that's the aspect of the mind when the mind re when the mind experiences the external world as it conventionally exists, then interprets it. And then upon that interpretation starts driving us around. That's where the Shen starts to get uneasy. That's what we would call in Taoism, the disturbance of the Shen. The disturbance of the Shen comes specifically from two sources, aversion and uh, desire. Those are the two poisons. Um, and so it's, and the ignorance is the third poison. This is Buddhist, by the way, which we fully have incorporated into our system. And the ignorance that underlies that aversion and desire is that we don't recognize that that object that we're relating to is only its conventional form, not its ultimate form. Ultimately, that thing will only be truly understood in non-dual awareness. When all things are, their truest natures are revealed, not their delusional formalities. So in that, in that sense, the mind is in that trajectory from the world into our most refined, unified um, part of our consciousness that is of the Tao itself, which exists in every person at all times. It is not a cultivated piece of us. It's, a, it's an uncovered piece of us. We call it the Shing, our inborn nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Shing being a, you know, a piece of the Tao or a manifestation of the Tao or not separate from the Tao. Yeah, that's in each of us. Yeah. Which means that every person's Shing is identical to every other person's Shing because there is no individuality at that layer or that level of humanity. If there were, that would mean that the Tao is a mosaic and it is not, it's a unity. And so our humanity, we have to recognize that self and other are conventional problematic terminologies in itself. That's where the root of real benevolence actually is formed. So earlier when Josh mentioned that line from the Tao Te Ching, from the one came two, two came three, this is another application of that. That one being the Tao and everybody's seeing is still part of the one, you know? Yeah. So that's how we have really, that's how we're able to experience non-duality. It'd be amazing if there were a, a way to get the entire planet to feel that and uh, yeah. stop all for the real. wars and all the hate, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, for uh, real. Plenty of that. And all of those, all of the wars and all of the hate are, are essentially boiled down to I want this or I don't want that, which is I right. want what they have or I don't want them around. And there you have a war already right. in the making. Mm -hmm. Whether those be small yeah. wars in the grocery line. When you're right. aggressive and cutting someone or pissed off that they cut you because you wanted to be out of there sooner than they're now allowing you, you know, all the way up to and including nations warring each other. And that's the, that's the thing is that people say, why are Taoists so apolitical or something like that? Because we try not to make and we don't make grand statements about political events. Why? Because ultimately and eventually there's a great possibility that any statement we make may prove to be ill-timed or something like that mm -hmm. but we're not really we don't care about the particulars we care about the fact that there's a disease that we are all infected with that disease is discrimination i want this i don't want that and as long as human beings are suffering from that disease we will perpetually be in a state of war or aggression or whatever 
And so we're really mm -hmm. deeply concerned with, with the antidote for that in general, rather than symptomatic bombs. You know what I mean? And so... Yeah, like Wang Kunyang and, and Liu Yiming both talk about this as sort of being, using my words, a disease of the illusory mind. You know, this, mm -hmm. this all of these things that we this want and this, you know, aversion to are actually, they're just part of our illusion of this existence, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're not, they're not part of our inner nature. That, that shame, that peace that's connected to the Tao. And so we run around, you know, being driven by this, this, this aversion to or this desire for, and it's causing us to make more and more, you know, bad decisions more often than not, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's still running around on illusion. It's not even real. It's not even the, the real us because at our, our deepest core, we're all one unified energy so to speak we're all one unified part of the Tao. and if we can have that experience of non-duality then that can blow that illusion up and we can we don't have to go that way but man that's a tough thing you know the illusion is strong so, so how did you two meet it seems like you're pretty enmeshed in a lot of <laughs> a lot of things and so i i liked just a few more questions how did you meet and this this friendship slash partnership, you know, brotherhood kind of bond develop, and then to forming of parting clouds, you know, uh, as a joint um, massive effort. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. So you know, as as is the case with most Taoists our age. Because the Taoists younger than us had a completely different experience, by the way. If mm. you're in your 30s <laughs> or in your 20s, you've had it really easy. <laughs> boy, oh boy, you were born at the right time. Um, so uh, being the age that we are, that means necessarily that we have had to stumble around in the dark for decades. Mm -hmm. Right, Jack? Totally. Yeah. And in our stumblings and fumblings and um, associations with this and that, searching for a community, literally. Liter I was literally searching for a community. Same. Um, there's, there was a promising Taoist community that I um, established relationship with, which is to say, signed up. Um, and then decided that it would be interesting if I could bring some of my own skills to the community. So I suggested, hey, the liturgy is untranslated, the Taoist liturgy, which is to say the morning and evening gongka, also the Sanguan, Beido Jing, and many others. But these are liturgical texts. They're not the kind we study, they're the kind we recite, and we study through recitation. Mm -hmm. In these texts is encrypted the fundamental doctrines of the lineage. Anyway, so as fundamental as they are, they were not translated. So I said, does anyone want to translate this with me? And that guy showed up. And so at night, while our very young children, like we had little kids where when they finally went up to bed and we'd get on Facebook Messenger and go line by line together. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. He didn't know what, we didn't know what we were doing, by the way, either. Um, and we just formed this relationship that was um, mutual assistance and study and integration. And we literally were creating one voice out of the two of our voices. Mm -hmm. And I think that that process of becoming one voice is a really fundamental, um, interesting aspect of the dynamic of Jack and I, because we are sort of seamless teachers. Many of our students who have even been with us for quite some time don't know which one of us is which. <laughs> <possibly>. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, the, anyway, as is the case with with many backstories, there was ultimately a lot of dissatisfaction with the group we were in. And this is not a critique of it. It's just it wasn't 
centered on Chinese language and scriptural study, things like that. So Jack and I sort of were looking around. A friend said, I'm going to China. Do you guys want to come with me? I've got a teacher over there that I want to introduce you to. And this was a friend of ours and more of an acquaintance, really. I mean, it was very, yeah. this whole thing was very unlikely. It shouldn't have occurred. We went, we met, we Zhang, met our teachers at yeah. Zhang Mingxin and, and our teacher Huang. And in those two places, immediately there was an obvious uh, relationship formed between us and these teachers. There were sequestered, divided times with them and and invitations to come back, things like that occurred that we were, it was clear to us that we should follow up on this and we should yeah. do it like they're asking to come alone. So we were walking around in the mountains and we were like, you know what? Our experience has been really trying. It's been a long time of learning languages, reading books, f messing around with other communities, trying to find our place. And it was deeply, um, dissatisfying and we thought how can we make this more satisfying for other people and in the ching chung mountains at the cave of Zhang daoling the very first taoist came forth the idea for parting clouds literally at the birthplace of taoism which is really special and i don't know if we ever think of it in that way but that's where we were that day when we had that walk and we decided to yeah. begin this journey together um, and Josh is definitely readers digesting this whole story into, right. you know, this, this was a, a long process, this whole thing, how, mm -hmm. it, how it ended up, but those were definitely the highlights for it. It was, again, it was a train, but it just, it just took off, you know? Yeah. Is Parting Clouds had... a physical location or is it a, a virtual uh, temple or, or cultural mm -hmm. learning center? We, it's, we have, you know, there's a, there's a temple space in New York where Josh lives. Mm -hmm. and there's also one here in Colorado, you know, and then we have most of our education is done online. Yeah. You know, but we do online and then we have retreats. So, you know, we've in through COVID, we started doing U.S. based retreats. Yeah. But typically what we've done is taken groups to China and done retreat style stuff there. Um, and now that China's back open, we'll probably start doing that again. That's you know, that's something we're working on, figuring out how to do if we want to do it anymore, and how that will look, and all of that. But at the moment, you know, we see this as you know we're a uh, Western Western based organization, and we need to spend time with our students in the West. And yeah. so, you know, while we've got, you know this our Colorado place, we've got our New York place, we, you know, we're actually in the, in the plans of spending time. We need to, we're going to go to the West coast and spend time. We have bunches of students in the Northwest. We have bunches of students in California, you know, so we want to spend time with them and open up some public teachings when we're in those places as well. But, you know, we, we realize that, you know, the community, we're a U S based organization. We need to spend time with our students in the U.S. We can't just drag them all to China. Yeah, yeah. We're we're starting to realize the um, the the relative uh, efficacy of focusing here. We have good relationships with the with the Chinese diaspora, uh, and we're we have really great support from uh, a Taoist community in New York City, who provided the ordination ceremony for our students during covid which i thought was extraordinary beautiful wonderful yeah and so we we really started thinking <clears throat> about not forgetting that you know a lot can happen here too um yeah. so we're balancing all of that out has become more and more important to us not just relying on, which is it's good and important to rely on china but not to do so in a way that is um uh, overly dependent yeah well in the beginning most of our retreats were china based we took groups of students over there and now we have so many you know, we have students in so many countries around the world now that our actual vision is to start spending more time with our students 
outside of China yeah. in their locations, you know. Yeah. I'd love to do one in Australia. We have a lot of Australian students, you know. Yeah. Um, we have, I mean, they're all over the place. So we want to help them establish their own sort of communities right. in and around them too. Wow, that's terrific. And so your three books um, that I'm aware of are the translation of the morning and evening altar uh, rituals and the noon one and the northern dipper, I think it is. Mm -hmm. Is it third yep. one? Yeah. Those are the four most consequential temple liturgical texts. Mm -hmm. There are others that happen throughout the year at certain nodes in the calendar, but they would be much more interspersed than these. These are all potentially daily read scriptures, um, and they really satisfy many of the, and answer many of the doctrinal questions around practiced and lived Longman Taoism. Mm -hmm. They're set up we to also, be that. We also have a Taoist medicine book that isn't publicly published at this point. It's only available to our students. And we also have a, a translation of, a, of another scripture that's talisman based that's only available to our students as well. We now see here's the thing. These other texts could be out in the wild, which other people tend to do um, in the interest of book sales. But we're not interested in book sales. We're interested in the edification of our community and, and the education of our community. So, you know. We've got, we have these other huge, we have these, this, the, the medicine book is a massive project. I mean, it's like, it's like the, uh, the dead men of Taoist medicine. Um, but uh, it's really, it would be inappropriate to let that one out because it would be without the various important transmission issues that it really requires. So, yeah, if we go back to the three treasures conversation at the very beginning of our talk today, right? You have to have the scriptures and you have to have the teacher to unlock the scriptures and so if we let something like that out that that above anything really needs unlocking yeah you know our, our the translations of the four scriptures that josh is mentioning those you know those are publicly published because there are so many Taoist teachers out there that need them yeah. i mean that that was a passion project for us because we knew that this was a huge gaping hole in the western practice of Taoism were those four great scriptures yeah and that you know we know of so many communities now that use those books you know openly or covertly <laughs> yeah <laughs> but they use them you know what I mean because they they, they are such a huge part of the practice mm -hmm. yeah. you know? oh, wonderful well I want to thank the two of you Jack Schaefer and Josh Painter for thank you uh, spending so much Thanks, time Mark. with us this uh this afternoon it's been to very wonderful uh getting to know you guys and and uh hearing your stories and the knowledge and wisdom that you're transmitting and cultivating in your students and bringing here to the west it's quite a task and you guys are definitely up for the challenge oh man thank you for having us this was yeah. super fun Thank yeah. you so much. And Mark, looking around your room and hearing some of the little <laughs> tidbits that you've shared, I'd rather interview you. Honestly, you seem far more interesting than us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd love you to see the other You've got side some there. great stories. Three more bookshelves. Oh, hold I'm on. sure. I'm going to cut this out of the thing, but over here is my wound on this side. Oh, oh yeah. cool. Right? Wow. Yeah. Yep. Yep. What a great and, spot. Uh, that is a cool spot. Well, hold on. I got. If I can go up, you can see some oh, more yeah. stuff. It's like oh, Filipino wow. stuff on that side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you guys got to oh, come. Man, I want to come in there and hang out. I'll, I would love to come visit. You know, Jack <laughs> Jack comes out and he does. He he hasn't spent much time on the East Coast at all. So when well, he gets out, we Jack, try to we try out. to make I'll our way around. Down and we'll do a we'll do a, a group here for people who I know who are serious about Taoism and would like to what? learn. Let's do that. That'd be yeah. fun. And, and let's do that because we, and I want to, we want to start doing that. 